My special guest today is uh, very, very exciting for me. Uh, his name is Professor David Flint, and he wrote this article on the Good Source yesterday: the Palace Letters and perfect constitutional propriety. Oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Let me tell you a little bit about him. We'll skip down to the highlight. Professor David Flint is an emeritus professor of law and was chairman of the Australian Broadcasting Authority and the Australian Press Council, president of the National Federation of the English Speaking Union, associate commissioner with the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and convener of the Committee of Australian Law Deans. He has been National Convener of Australians for Constitutional, Mo Constitutional Monarchy since the 1999 referendum campaign and the author of several books. He has published widely on topics such as the media, international economic law and on the Constitution, the subject of today's interview. At Barcelona in 1991, he received a World Jurist Association Award as World Outstanding Legal Scholar. And he was made member of the Order of Australia in 1995. Welcome, sir. It's uh, wonderful to have you on Pillow Talk. Well, it's a great honour for me to appear, and I'm delighted that I'm speaking also to your supporters who are contributing to a very important, a very important part of the media, and I would hope a growing part of the media. So, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Uh, add my thanks again to that. Um, and uh, and look, it's uh, an opportune time, I guess, just to mention that if you would like to become a supporter, the more the merrier. We're uh, nowhere near achieving our goals uh, so far. Where there's more production staff to hire, um, but you can become a supporter by heading to goodsource.news slash support. And that's S-A-U-C-E, goodsource.news slash support. Um, so, Professor David Flint, uh, we have the Palace Letters and uh, the, uh, re those behind the Republican movement uh, have developed a, a wonderful conspiracy theory in, and uh, that conspiracy theory is that the Queen was in on it. Uh, she was trying to interfere in Australian politics. Uh, back in 1975. Uh, they have a long memory and uh, do not forgive quickly if there was ever any wrong <laughs> in the first place. I, I think it's more wishful thinking than reality. But why don't you set the scene? Take us back to 1975 for those of us uh, not born in that year, which includes me. Uh, what was going on and, and why was there a question that the Governor-General of Australia may need to uh, get involved? Well, uh, just to explain very briefly, when we decided to federate, and we are of any country in the world, the one which is really most properly described as a child of both the United Kingdom and the United States. We borrowed very heavily in relation to the United States, but we drew the line about having an executive presidency. We decided that, uh, and Sir Samuel Griffiths, the, the former Queensland Premier who became ultimately the Chief Justice of Australia, argued, and this was accepted generally, that having a single executive, which was the basis of the American Constitution, was unwise. But we are, in many respects, a child of both. The Glorious Revolution of 1688 in Britain, which established the first version of the constitutional monarchy where the king was still the executive, the effective executive, and uh, also the United States, which in many ways under Hamilton copied very much what they saw as the English constitution. What they particularly liked was the separation of powers that Montesquieu, the French philosopher, discovered in the English, which answers the eternal problem made by the great uh, Catholic peer and historian, Lord Acton. Lord Acton said that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what the English speaking peoples in particular have discovered is the way to solve that through the separation of powers, 
and through checks and balances in the constitutional system. It's worked very well, both in Britain and the Commonwealth and in the United States. And the, the expressions, the expressions that you find in the in the Declaration of Independence, which really reflect the teachings of Locke and Montesquieu in relation to the English Constitution, I mean, the American Constitution in particular, that uh, we believe that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By the pursuit of happiness, they don't mean just sitting around and uh, having a cigarette and a glass of wine, what they really meant, happiness, happiness in the human institutions of the family, and of enjoying the right to carry on a business and private property and so on. But this, this is all very common to all of us. And once we chose, once we chose the system of constitutional monarchy, which only emerged in England, in, the, in Britain in the 19th century, where effectively the government is controlled from the lower house. It must have the confidence of the lower house. Once we accepted that, we, we brought over all of the conventions that come with that. And because, because uh, the constitutional monarchy, as Britain knows it, Australia knows it, as Canada knows it, in a way breaches the separation of powers in that you no longer have a completely separate executive because the executive is under the control of the lower house and can be removed whenever they lose a vote of confidence in the lower house. There had to be yet another check and balance and that emerged as many things just emerge in Britain through trial and error, that emerged through the king or the queen having a number of important reserved powers normally exercised on the advice of the ministers but in special circumstances where something goes wrong becoming a constitutional guardian and one of those particular reserved powers is in relation to the appointment and the dismissal of governments and there, there is a convention that uh, not only, not only must you have the confidence of the lower house, a government under our system has to be able to provide supply. If they can't provide the money to run the government, to pay for the army, to pay for the police, to pay for the public service, to pay debts and so on, if they can't deliver money, then the convention is that the prime minister must advise a general election so that the people decide the issue or alternatively the prime minister must resign and leave it to the queen or the governor general in our case to uh, appoint another person as prime minister that that was very clear mr whitlam knew this in 1975 in 1975 the the opposition was very unhappy with the government and in particular over what was called the loans affair. This was an attempt by the government through extraordinarily informal sources, including uh, a person who seemed to be a, probably a shyster who promised them that he would be able to get money for the government. They authorized him to get the money. Kemlani was his name, and it was going to be billions of dollars, and the purpose was to buy back all of the assets, the big assets in Australia, owned by foreign investors. It was an extraordinary project, and uh, it obsessed the Whitlam government, and particularly obsessed the minister involved, Rex Connor. The extraordinary thing was Australia has a very good credit rating. If we wanted to borrow money, we could do it through the uh, through legitimate sources in New York and in London. But instead of doing that, we only do this through the back door. And the purpose was also extraordinary. It was authorized in a special meeting of the Executive Council. And curiously, they waited until the Governor General was not there to preside over the Executive Council. 
and the vice president, who was a minister, presided. So it was done without the governor general being present, and they authorized without notice the authority of the Commonwealth to borrow billions of dollars, for several hundred billion of dollars, which, of course, in 1975 was worth much more than it's worth now. Still worth a lot of money. But it, it was really to buy back all that foreign investment, an extraordinary program, and done without the Governor General being present. He signed the minute later because it had taken place. But uh, Sir John Kerr was put on notice that something funny was going on. When the opposition learned of this and learned that when they decided, the government decided that they couldn't get the money because Kemblani wasn't producing the money, they withdrew the authority to do it. Rex Connor continued to try to get the money against Whitlam's instructions. Whitlam dismissed him, but the opposition was so upset by this, they said that uh, they would use their powers to refuse to pass the budget and the supply bills until the Prime Minister went to the Governor General and ordered a new election. They said that this was so reprehensible, something had to be done. In my view, I think that um, uh, Malcolm Fraser really didn't need to do this because the government was in the process of reforming. They were improving. It would have been better for Malcolm Fraser to have waited for about another year because an election would have been due he would have won that election clearly because the Whitlam government was unpopular at that stage. And he would have been able to do the things he wanted to do, which subsequently in 1975, he didn't do because he was terrified of again dividing the nation. So I think in many ways it was a misstep. But I'm speaking with all the benefits of hindsight. Mm. What happened was that they, they, they withheld supply, the supply bills, which authorized the government spending money raised in tax that year. You need that, you need that government's authority under the Constitution. Once those bills reached the Senate, they were held in the Senate on condition that the government first advised the Governor General to hold an election. And, and what, uh, what you've reminded me, David, what you've reminded me through Professor Aroni is that one of the schemes they developed was to circumvent the Senate. One was to first present the bills straight to the Governor General without the Senate approving them. That, that was so unconstitutional. Uh, Gough Whitlam decided eventually not to do that, although some of his ministers were saying to do that. But the Governor General would never have signed a bill without it being approved by the Senate. But the other one was what uh, you have mentioned from Professor let's, uh Let's read that quote from uh, yes. Professor Aroni, uh, just to bring the audience up to speed with what you and I are privy to, because uh, it was news to me. Um, and so uh, Professor Nicholas Aroni is a professor of constitutional law at uh, the University of Queensland, a very prestigious law school. Uh, and uh, he uh, commented this morning on his personal Facebook page, it's not uncommon that a journalist interviews me for commentary on some current constitutional issue, but in the end doesn't quote me. And when I read the article they publish, it's clear that my commentary didn't fit with the narrative they wanted to promote. This happened again just yesterday in relation to the release of the letters between Governor-General John Kerr and the Queen's advisers prior to the dismissal of Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister in November 1975, the so-called Palace Letters. One thing the letters have revealed, which no one is talking about, is the significance of the Treasurer's plan, once the money ran out in December, to issue, quote, certificates of indebtedness, end quote, to public servants in the hope they might be paid advances by the banks in lieu of their salaries on the basis of their certificates. It was being proposed that the government would, sometime in the future, somehow convince the Parliament to pass retrospective legislation authorising the issue of these certificates and ensuring the banks would be repaid, including interest. An extraordinary proposal, to say the least, especially given that the root of the problem was that the Senate was refusing to pass the supply bills in the first place. It's well recognised that the Governor-General has a reserve power to dismiss a Prime Minister who cannot guarantee supply and refuses to call an election or resign. 
Of course, the controversy is whether this applies when the Prime Minister has the confidence of the House of Representatives and it is the Senate that is refusing supply. But what is significant about the certificates of indebtedness is that it was the prospect of the government potentially engaging in illegal conduct that was also an important factor in Kerr's reasoning. It is well recognised that illegality is an additional ground on which a Governor-General might legitimately exercise the reserve powers, although controversy surrounds the precise circumstances in which this should occur. To my mind, this element is the most significant revelation of the palace letters. Uh, I'm loving this education in our constitution, that uh, this, uh, this frenzied conspiracy theory and ensuing debate uh, has, has stimulated. So that's the, the additional ground that I, I think uh, the media and certainly the Republican movement is reluctant to uh, consider at the moment. I think Professor Aroni is absolutely right. This was in the background. The Governor General didn't use it in his letter removing the commission, withdrawing the commission, but he was clearly aware of it. When uh, that plan was proposed, that is, borrow, effectively borrow money from the banks on the authority of the Commonwealth, even though this would try to circumvent the Senate refusing supply. The banks indicated very quickly they obviously took legal advice, perhaps from Professor Aroni, but they certainly took legal advice, and that legal advice was such that they indicated to the government that they would not play ball with the government. They would not get a cent from the banks on that authority. Now, this recalls the only other case in Australian history where a viceroy has withdrawn the commission of a government of a of a prime minister or a premier who has the confidence of the lower house. That occurred in 1934 in New South Wales, when Jack Lang was upset because the Commonwealth insisted on paying interest on the bonds, bonds that the Commonwealth had issued, some to overseas bondholders, some to bondholders in Australia. The government insisted on paying that from the taxes received without, uh, so that the states had less money available. Jack Lang did something extraordinary. He withdrew all of the funds of the, of the, of the government of New South Wales. There's an interesting photograph somewhere of his, his chauffeur-driven car uh, taking him to the bank in Martin Place and taking out the money. He took the money. This is the, the, the money of the state of New South Wales. He took the money and stored it in secret at the Trades Hall building in Sydney. You're joking! That's true. And I remember I there was a debate a few, few years ago at that place. It was the Trades Hall. And uh, uh, the Republicans who convened the, convened the debate obviously weren't aware of this. And I said, I'm delighted to be here because it, it refers to another place of significant constitutional matters in Australian history. Well, Fascinating. Uh, the, South, the governor of New South Wales, Philip Gay, who was English, was appointed by the British. And we was, New South Wales is still in many ways in a colonial situation because they didn't trust the Commonwealth. So appointments of governors until the Australia Act was made on the advice of British ministers. But usually the Premier would advise the British ministers and the British ministers would advise the Queen. That was only because they didn't trust the Commonwealth to do it. And uh, uh, Sir Philip Gay was very tolerant and he, he, warned, he warned Jack Lane several times several times, and eventually withdrew his commission. Now, Lang seriously thought of arresting the governor and staying in power, but he realized that that would have involved the Commonwealth because the Commonwealth would have had to, had to do something and probably release the governor because there would be no authority for holding the governor. So Lang eventually accepted his dismissal. The, the, the uh, governor appointed the opposition leader as the caretaker premier on the condition that he ordered an election or advised an election immediately, which took place and Lang, Lang lost office in a landslide against him. The people of New South Wales didn't like that. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of history. Now, Sir John Kerr, who was the former Chief Justice of New South Wales, would have been well aware of that. It was in the background. He doesn't mention it in withdrawing the commission, but Whitlam did 
consider involving being involved in illegal activities. Now, Gough Whitlam knew that he only had two choices. All he could do, whether or not, whether or not uh, uh, Malcolm Fraser was right, the facts were supply wasn't being granted. And Gough Whitlam, however much he may have been annoyed with Fraser for the Liberal Coalition, the Liberals and Nationals doing it for a second time because they'd done it in, in 1974 and he won that election. He still only had two choices. One was to advise a general election and he fortunately had grounds for a double dissolution so the Senate would go to the electorate too or to resign. And uh, instead he went to Government House on the 11th of November with spurious advice. His advice was hold a half Senate election. Now that was ridiculous and he knew it was ridiculous because the new senators would only take office uh, eight months later on the 1st of July 1976. So the government wouldn't have supply till then, which would be, it would, it would have led to a breakdown. But mm. the other thing was several of the governors had been advised by their governments not to issue the writs. Because to hold a half Senate election or hold any Senate election, it's the governors of each state, because it is the state's house, who actually issue the writs and the terms are fixed for the Senate. They don't, uh, they don't change as the House does. So uh, that, that was a spurious suggestion and Sir John immediately dismissed that and uh, gave Mr. Whitlam a letter indicating that uh, his commission had been withdrawn. Sir John immediately called the, uh, in fact, he was waiting, he immediately called Fraser, pointed him caretaker on condition on condition that nothing improper was done during the period and that the government uh, immediately recommend an election which was held within three weeks so that the issue went to the people. That's not being discussed these days. And that's an important mm. matter. It was really left for the people to resolve. What was a political dispute between two very obstinate men? Yes, and, and I do agree with you, um, and you, you've enlightened me so much, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of viewers, especially those uh, born after 1975, uh, who are grateful for the enlightenment on, on the context. Uh, now, something you haven't uh, touched on, on yet is the palace letters, so let's get to that. In today's The Australian, uh, we have somebody who was really leading the attack against the monarchy, somebody who cannot be accused of prejudice or bias uh, uh, against um, the Republican movement. Um, he was a, a very big advocate of it when we had a referendum on it in 1999, uh, and that is Paul Kelly. And in The Australian Today, Paul Kelly writes an article entitled Anti-Monarchists lose the plot and, and that's actually <laughs> the uh, word i've used for them um, this morning before reading this anti-monarchists uh, they're not actually for anything they have no coherent uh, plan which we can uh, consider uh, for what the future holds they only know what they don't like this is a very accurate label despite what they'd like to be called and the subheading is the sad decline of the Australian Republican movement is on display in its angry and convoluted attacks on the Queen. And uh, it's well known that uh, the pirate of Neutral Bay, otherwise known as uh, Peter Fitzsimmons, he's uh, actually here responding to this professor who launched a <laughs> legal case, taking it all the way to the High Court uh, to have these amazing letters revealed between uh, so the Governor General John Kerr and uh, the Buckingham Palace at the time. The conspiracy theory is that uh, Buckingham Palace was uh, involved and, and the Queen had uh, knowledge of uh, what was going on and, and thereby uh, inappropriately interfering in the Australian uh, constitutional matters and, and Australian democracy. Uh, which we're fiercely defending defending of, uh, and I, I guess uh, we don't disagree. Um, so Professor Flint uh, actually wrote this article um, yesterday. Here we go. Or published it yesterday or the day before. Um, and uh, just, I guess, providing a different perspective than what the uh, anti-monarchists are saying, uh, something which Paul Kelly agrees with um, Professor Flint 
is uh, somewhat ham-fisted and um, they have egg on their face. Uh, so please talk us through what the palace letters, what the anti-monarchists uh, claim they establish and uh, what they actually establish, if you will. Let me, uh, if I may, begin by explaining why I'm a monarchist. I was asked this a couple of years ago by one of the London television companies that have a major news broadcast, ITV, and they wanted me to make some comments, which they're going to put, or I'm sure they put into some uh, some dungeon somewhere to be produced at the end of the reign. As, uh, and when the Queen passes away and the new King comes, they wanted comments from Australia and they wanted them in advance. They asked me why I was a constitutional monarchist, and I said for three reasons. First, a very great respect for the Queen and for her father. Second, because on at least four occasions, I've sworn an oath of allegiance. I don't think you break an oath lightly. There may be some fundamental reasons why an oath of allegiance has to be broken because the other party doesn't do the service that was intended. But I don't think you break that sort of oath. The same way that when you go into court, you swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You don't do what some politicians do when they swear the oath of allegiance, put your hand behind your back and uh, cross your fingers. You just don't do that. But I think it's wrong. And, but thirdly, the reason is constitutional. And the, the model which the Republicans produce, the onus is on them to produce a viable model. The model they produce was really of what we call the politician's republic because it would have been the only republic in the world and the only republic in history where the prime minister could sack the president without any notice, without any grounds, or without any right of appeal. In other words, the president was to be turned into a puppet of the prime minister. This was a shocking republic, highly flawed, and and many of us thought that this would be this would vastly increase the powers of the political class. So that's that's the background. That of those pushing for a republic in 1999, Paul Kelly was probably more significant in many ways than Malcolm Turnbull, because Paul Kelly was the editor of the Australian. He was the flag bearer of the republic. All of the media followed the Australian. And in addition to that, in addition to that, the uh, the um, the politicians followed the media. I would think uh, probably at least two thirds of the sitting politicians were Republicans. Most of the others just kept their heads under the parapet, and only a few came out. So it was a it was a very important period. And Kelly was a key for Kelly to now say that these letters, the the Republican movement in pushing the argument, there would be something in the letters which would reveal that the Queen was complicit in the decision of her to sack the Prime Minister was always ridiculous. No seasoned observer ever thought that that was the case. So what we have, what we have is uh, these letters which have been released. Uh, Professor Hocking, who has an obsession about, she's a Republican, she's on the Republican movement, leading council. She has an obsession of getting some silver bullet which will deliver some sort of republic, because they don't, haven't explained what sort of republic they have now, into her hands. And uh, she was so obsessed, she pushed this line and some of the media then went along with her. The letters were between Sir John and the Queen. They were to be released in 2027. Normally these are kept, kept uh, in secret until uh, time has passed and people are no longer as passionate about the issue as they are. All government papers of this confidentiality are usually kept secret. These were normally in the past thought of as personal papers. The Federal Court and the Federal Court of Appeal decided that they were. Professor Hocking pushed it into the High Court. The High Court, which normally only accepts 10% of the cases seeking special leave to appeal, actually heard it, and I think there were far more important things to do than hear this. They decided they were Commonwealth records and therefore should be released under the Archives Act. Anyway, they were released. As everybody knew, anybody who had any sense knew, as Paul Kelly knew and Troy Bramston, 
argued in the Australian, there was nothing in the papers in any way implicating the Queen. The Australian constitution was the very first in the old empire, the very first constitution of any self-governing dominion, which provided that the executive powers are directly exercisable by the governor general. All the others left it with the queen and then there would be special instructions delegating those powers to the governor general. Our constitution specifically gave the powers, the exercise of those powers to the governor general. The queen had no power. The queen cannot appoint or dismiss a prime minister. It's only the governor general who can do that. Only the governor general can order an election. The queen cannot do that. So the, 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 the queen as part of the crown has very limited powers. Most of the powers are vested in the governor general or in the state governors and they're exercisable by them. So there was going to be nothing in these letters. Uh, they were looking, as I say, for a silver bullet. Now with egg on their face, they're trying to drag something out of these letters, which they say justifies changing our constitution. The only reason you change a constitution, I think, is if it's going to significantly improve the governance of Australia. And there are pre plenty of problems about the governance of Australia, which I think need fixing up. Mm. The last one is the, the, way in which, the way in which the governors and governors general exercise their, their role in their conflict. I agree. I I think the constitution uh, is is one of the in, in fact our constitution uh correct me if i'm wrong is it in the top 10 or top 20 of oldest constitutions in the world well in terms of written constitutions it probably it certainly is, is within the top 10 and it was the right. first the first constitution in the world to be specifically approved by the people it was an extraordinary operation wow. Once they got their act together uh, under the Corowa plan, which was uh, devised by Sir John Quick, who should be known by every school child in Australia, but would be completely unknown to them. He devised the Corowa plan, which was approved at a private conference. And what it was, was that future conventions should be directly elected by the people. And after consultation with the politicians, they should then, they should then put their final settled draft to the people. And that's what happened. There had to be two. There had to be two uh, referendums in Australia. Hmm. All that was all that was done, including taking it to London and getting it through the uh, the British Parliament and also waiting for the West Australians who were rather slow in getting their their referendum so that the Queen could be satisfied, Queen Victoria, of the present Queen. The Queen mm. would be satisfied that the West Australians wanted to come in. She would then issue a proclamation, which she did, creating our Commonwealth on the first day of the new millennium, of the new century in the new millennium, mm. January 1901. Quite a glorious thing. The extraordinary thing, David, this is really extraordinary, and I'm sure children in school don't know this great triumph. It was a triumph because the people were directly involved, and that is that in four years, in four years from the beginning of that final convention to the getting to having the queen sign the proclamation to put it into place within four years this new country the only country in the world the only nation in the world which occupies a whole continent came into place and it was a, the first constitution to be actually approved by the people now that was an extraordinary that's remarkable in, in Sydney, it takes longer using 19th century technology to put a tram track down George Street, Sydney. It's taken about six years to do that. We can't do that. Four years, you can't put it, you can't build a dam in four years. But that mm. was done by our ancestors. I think it's an extraordinary credit to this nation. One of the things I want to achieve with the good source um, is the education of voters. I, I think uh, a, a lack in our education, uh, which really, you're right, should be in school, um, is one of the things that results in lower quality government today. 
where we have oh, voters that can be bought, essentially bought, with pork barrelling uh, and emotional ma manipulation and slick marketing. Uh, I think if we raise the political uh, IQ of the average voter, we, we go a long way to raising the quality of votes and subsequent governments. So uh, I would love to, and it's my goal, to um, have the good source uh, speakers and, and personalities actually become speakers and develop a resource uh, either in person or delivered remotely um, via video, uh, which actually educates um, high school students, specifically those likely to vote within two or three years, so senior high school students, on the glorious aspects of our traditions, those things we can be proud of uh, in our ancestors, such as which you've just explained. Remarkable achievements in a maturing uh, world, uh, newly valuing um, egalitarianism and liberalism and pluralism uh, and, and these freedoms which are naturally given and recognised by jurists rather than created and, and granted by governments. Um, so I, gee, I would I would so love to do a series of of um, well lectures um, recordings with you and and maybe other constitutional um, professors uh, just to uh, bring this down to I guess the the average man level the the blue collar uh, even high school level just to say this is our history this is who we are this is our identity and this is what we are caretakers of uh, as as new voters as future voters as old voters um, and and the leaders of tomorrow what a wonderful uh program to deliver to high schools either via video or or in person as, as a brief series of of lectures wouldn't you think i think that would be absolutely magnificent you know when we talk about the constitution it's not just the document which was a compact between self-governing states and the people of the self-governing states. I like that definition given by Bolingbroke after the, the uh, Glorious Revolution in England. Uh, he, he said the Constitution is that assembly of laws, customs and institutions by which the people have agreed to be governed. Note that by which the people have agreed to be governed. There must be agreement by the people, but this means a people who are well informed, who are a virtuous people, because they obviously also. So important. So important. Um, yeah, and absolutely I, critical. Yes. And I, there's part of our culture, and you find in the Declaration of Independence, really, something which is, it, it, it came from, it came from Britain. The, the the civil the the war of independence was really a civil war and uh, i think that the king and the government in london weren't well advised they were in better if they'd had burke in the government because he and pitt they would have they wouldn't have had a, a war with the colonies but i think in that declaration of independence that core which says man is equal men were created equal and they were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. But the important thing is, we don't get our rights. We don't get our rights from the politicians. They end up there at the National Cabinet, and they're telling us what we can do and so on. They don't give us our rights. We, were, we got our rights from God. Rights, you're born with rights. It's the natural law, and we are entitled to exercise that. I think that's, that's a crucially important thing, which is not taught in school. Is it's not taught in universities or law law um, faculties. Um, it is one of the things I learned as I started this uh, three years ago, interviewing uh, Martin Isles, who was then the uh, managing director and founder of the Human Rights Law Alliance. And uh, he introduced me to the term legal positivism. And, and I love big words. I love using them. And I love coming across ones that I haven't heard before. And uh, rather than feeling dumb, um, I just ask, what does that mean? I've never heard that word before. And so he explained to me on, on camera what legal positivism is, essentially 
uh, and feel free to correct me if I don't uh, explain this as well as a constitutional law professor might, but uh, to me, it was basically the belief that the power to create a law or the power to make a law uh, therefore makes the, the law right and true it, by its own authority, whereas uh, the opposite, which you just explained and in which I subscribe to, um, certainly as a Christian, uh, but also as a conservative and I think a right-thinking person, uh, is that the opposite is natural law um, and that law is not made by men, it is discovered by men and flows from the very heart and throne of God uh, as uh, one of the, I think it might be, correct me if I'm wrong, Blackstone uh, has a really great quote about the many tributaries of the heart or of a river system um, with a single origin but then flowing out into many directions. Uh, so laws uh, have many aspects and, and um, details which emanate from the very throne, heart and mind of God. Did I get that jurist's name right? Was it Blackstone or was it someone else? Uh, yes, uh, and you've you've uh, summarised him beautifully. And, and that, is, that is so correct. Thank you. It's been lost. I think by uh, by uh, treating the constitution as a living constitution, mm. thereby the judges, particularly the American judges, then interpreting that and inventing inventing rights which don't exist and were never in the constitution, which we're seeing mm. we see particularly in the United States. But I think you are absolutely right, and uh, we, we must return to the origins and. Uh, it, it, this is, a, of course, a big issue, a very big issue in the United States, but also here yeah, mm. in Australia too. It is here, and this is something that uh, I think we need to cover and it would be wonderful to inoculate future voting generations against is to the point that we might reverse the trend is, is the trend of the High Court of Australia uh, to constantly reinvent and reinterpret into our constitution meanings um, and intents that were never there, uh, being revisionist in, instead of um, instead of being uh, those positivists in, instead of being uh, observing the original tense and, and those things that we agreed to. If it's if it's not the law that we've agreed. Um, as, as you said, a constitution that binds and guides us, if it's uh, just a suggestion that we're free to reinterpret at the whim of the current members of the High Court, um, then it really isn't a constitution at all. It's, it's just that, a suggestion, and, and that's clearly uh, not what it should be. So how great to then get future voters and future governments to um, bring us back in that direction to... Um, what the constitution and the commonwealth of, of states was always meant to be. Um, so some comprehensive education may be part of the solution. I agree. I, I think, uh, and I often ask people this uh, when I'm speaking, can you identify a significant problem in Australia, which if it were not created by the politicians, has been made significantly worse by them? And invariably, they can't identify a problem which hasn't been made greater by the politicians or made significantly worse. And a great part of the reason for their ability to do this are activist judges who make the Constitution mean what they want it to mean and not what it was intended to mean and clearly intended to mean. We've just seen that in the United States, for example, in the in uh, the rewriting of the uh, Civil Rights Act by extraordinary, extraordinary by one of uh, one of President Trump's appointees, Gorsuch, who extraordinarily uh, rewrites the Civil Rights Act so that it includes transgender uh, transgender people. Now, when the Congress passed the Civil Rights Act, they probably had never heard. Of course. Of transgender issues. And Gorsuch was part of that. Yes, and Gorsuch was the, he wrote the opinion in which he, when he was in the federal court. How disappointing. Yes, when he was in the federal court, he twice made statements which indicated that he was an originalist. That is, that he believed that words in legislation, words in the Constitution, have the meaning which they, which was the ordinary meaning at the time. They were mm. not, which I think is the reason thing to assume. And but they 
he, he has them traits, which is it, it is sad. And I think this indicates to me that the solution must be that the final decision on these should really be with the people. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln identified this problem himself because he had it. This, this would probably be, we're going outside of the area, but Abraham Lincoln had had a similar problem in relation to slavery and the role of the Supreme Court in the recognition of slavery. And uh, the idea, as Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia said, if the American people had known that the Constitution would mean whatever nine men and women in black robes wanted it to mean, they probably would never have signed the Constitution. They would never have approved the Constitution. And I think uh, Justice Scalia, that great American judge who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, mm. uh, he, he, uh, he very clearly stated what the problem is. You can't leave high questions of constitutional policy. Yes. yes. Seven in Australia or nine men and women, they now are. They yeah. These things permanently, so that you can never change it until they change their minds. Yeah. Well, let's wrap this up. Um, the Queen's letters, the the Palace letters, uh, reveal that uh, that uh, he, the the Governor General at the time, um, Sir, um, was it William Clerk Kerr? Yeah. William was it? Uh, good. Sir John. I, uh, Sir John Gordon. Kerr. John Kerr. Okay, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm getting that completely wrong. Everyone, John Kerr. We've got it now. You're young, David. Uh, thank, thanks to smarter people than me in this conversation. Uh, we've got it right now. Um, in his, uh, he continued that he decided to take the step without informing the palace in advance because the responsibility is his. And I was of the opinion that it was better for Her Majesty to not know in advance, though it is, of course, my duty to tell her immediately. Uh, inscrutable. Uh, sorry, not inscrutable, uh, in, unimpeachable confirmation that there was no conspiracy, uh, despite the anti-monarchist's theory to the contrary. Uh, and the Queen's secretary uh, replied, if I may say so with the greatest respect, I believe that in not informing the Queen what you intended to do before doing it, you acted not only with perfect constitutional propriety, but also with admirable consideration for her Majesty's position. So that is very good. Thank you for that article, and uh, thank you for your wonderful explanations this morning. I, I don't think they can be done briefly uh, and adequately, um, and uh, certainly there's a lot of education and background in this that's very important for those people who are guilty of not being born um, before 1975. So. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor David Flint, for your generous time this morning, and I uh, hope to talk to you again uh, very soon. And thank you, David, for the opportunity, splendid opportunity, to be able to try and explain this issue. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, that's it for Pello Talk for this episode. Um, and don't go away, uh, Professor Flint, after we officially end the interview, we'll have a little bit more conversation for the benefit of those people in the Good Source supporters group who are uh, watching and uh, getting the behind the scenes interview. But for the rest of you, this is the end of the interview. Feel free to become a Good Source supporter by heading to goodsource.news forward slash support. Uh, and on that website, you can also subscribe to lots of uh, lots of um, updates, all those things that are happening uh, multiple times a day with short and long articles, videos, podcasts, as well as the traditional article uh, things that are going on there. So um, that's it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the comments section and in the next episode and show released from The Good Source. But that's the end for Pella Talk this time. It's time for us to do something. Na, 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 na.